All right, wonderful to see you all here this morning. So climate change and land use change have pronounced impacts on the outmigration bottleneck of endangered coho salmon. Uh, that's particularly true in the Russian River watershed where our work is focused. And I'll specifically talk about the impacts of shallow water depths on outmigration timing with you all today. Some uh, key messages I hope you'll uh, take with you today. Preserving the outmigration window um, in time is critical for coho conservation. But this becomes particularly challenging as shallow water depths do limit outmigration as our data show. Uh, but with uh, these results, uh, we're able to hopefully inform in-stream flow recommendations that are based on the time of year, minimum depth requirements for outmigration, as well as the specific discharge to water depth relationships that I'll share with you. COHO are state and federally listed um, in our study area, uh, which is uh, located uh, here near the southernmost extent of their range. And it's supported by a conservation hatchery that releases the juveniles into seven uh, different streams, five of which are covered in our study. Important to note that these are genetically very similar, which allows us to um, assume, in this case, that, uh, that variability in their migration timing is largely due to environmental variability. It's uh, also important to note the uh, very uh, rigid life um, cycle that the coho have in California. Um, as they go through this life cycle and reach the small stage, if they don't leave the system at the age uh, of one, their chances of survival into the next season are incredibly low. Um, but the outmigration season does coincide with the spring flow recession. Climate change is only expected to accelerate um, that flow recession, which will put increasing pressures on currently existing water over allocation, groundwater use, and diversions that exist in this system um, surrounding some of the vineyard and domestic uses of water. And so if that's not enough to convince you that outmigration is a really important uh, life stage to focus on, here's a bit more that goes uh, beyond freshwater and into the marine realm. They have a higher chance of survival if they reach the ocean during a period of high food abundance. But the uh, coastal upwelling that really drives the primary productivity um, and higher trophic levels as a food source is highly unpredictable in time. Therefore, the literature suggests that, that outmigration time and variation, and as we'll show in the study, the duration um, are thought to dampen some of the consequences for the metapopulation and really build that uh, resilience of the metapopulation. So the focus of my PhD is really to begin to understand in this intermittent um, system um, what really controls the outmigration timing. So here we have um, example of data from 2018 for one of our creeks and uh, the detections of out-migrating smolts here on the y-axis. So we'll note that um, there's a certain duration um, of this out-migration. There are some peaks, there are some troughs, but we really don't um, have the best understanding of what controls that, which can inform how we make management decisions. So we first look at uh, this the literature to understand uh, what some of these controls are. Uh, this outmigration does occur uh, largely between March and June. We have to acknowledge some of these endogenous controls associated with this multiplication process. And the literature have suggested there are certain environmental controls on the system. Uh, absolute water temperature as well as the rate of change of water temperature are shown to even cue outmigration. Uh, similarly, discharge. The lunar phase associated with uh, ability to evade predators, even the day length and more recently the gradient of the, of the stream as well as productivity in the stream are thought to influence uh, the queuing of migration. And very little of this work has really been done in Mediterranean climates, these intermittent uh, stream systems that we have, which really drives some of the research questions. Number one, what stream water depths support the greatest rates of coho smolt out migration? And number two, does temporal variation in water depth explain variation in outmigration timing? And this work is focused on five streams uh, located in the lower Russian River Basin. 
Our study uh, reaches are a half to two kilometers in length at the lower portions of these tributaries where we start to see this outmigration uh, occurring. But important to note that our outmigration timing at the ends of these tributaries is not equivalent to ocean entry timing, which is a bit unknown to us. So let's uh, zoom out on some of the variability in outmigration timing and look at two different uh, creeks in our study area and uh, four different water years. The dashed orange line represents the approximate average time of the years of peak outmigration. And what we see here is some um, interannual variability. Um, you can see if we consider that more average um, outmigration time, that um, in the first year here, which is associated with a drought, we see some of these peaks in outmigration um, occurring relatively early. Much of that outmigration occurs before March 1st. But on the contrary, um, during some of the wetter years um, in the later parts of this study, we see that outmigration is occurring a little bit later in the season. So there are some interannual signatures that, are, um, that occur in multiple streams, but there are also some unique characteristics of the streams that may influence outmigration timing. And we might see some of those um, expressing themselves here, for example, in Mill Creek, which kind of has these tails in outmigration, which we don't see happening as much um, in Green Valley Creek. And we chose some tributaries that also are geomorphically quite diverse. Uh, Porter Creek is characterized in this uh, particular reach by a lot of bank armoring, Willow Creek by a lot of live wood, Felta Creek by a lot of incision in agricultural areas, and Mill Creek by a more uh, pool, uh, step pool sequence geomorphology. Our study design um, utilizes some uh, terrific data set collected by California Sea Grant. Uh, of outmigration timing from passive integrated transponder tags and the associated antenna arrays. We also measured discharge during, during two study seasons. And as was mentioned um, this morning briefly, um, we used these riffle crest bow wake uh, depth measurements as the locations where we measured these shallow water depths. Um, along the longitudinal profile, they are the shallowest geomorphically repeating um, feature in the system. And along the cross-section, um, it's the foul way, so it's the deepest part, and therefore the likely route that these out-migrating two miles are likely to follow. Um, seen again here. And so in order to get continuous uh, riffle crest foul wave uh, water depth data, we just did a simple linear regression um, between the um, over 16 median RCTs that were collected, um, each of which were from uh, 12 different RCT uh, measurements um, per study time. And once we um, revisit this original plot that I showed, and then overlay some of this continuous um, water depth data, we see some pretty um, striking results here in how those water depths do impact the outmigration time. So for example, early in the season, uh, we see some of these peaks associated with uh, the high flow events around here. And then of course we have this more um, expected um, outmigration uh, peak here during the spring flow recession. And we can start to think of these water depths from a management perspective as well. The CDFW currently has a critical riffle assessment method, which suggests that uh, there should be at least a 12 centimeter water depth maintained at 25% of the total width and 10% of the contiguous width at these riffle crests. And so that, um, that depth is uh, depicted, depicted here in this dashed line. And the green shaded areas show locations of where outmigration is actually occurring at depths below that of the critical riffle approach. So um, it shows that this approach um, is most likely going to, it's going to have a pretty high certainty to protect outmigrating students. <coughs> the RCT, riffle crest approach, um, provides another method of uh, getting a better understanding of, of how these water depths more specifically affect that time. And now let's look at one particular year, uh, 2018, and some variability in the stream in the outmigration time. So uh, Porter Creek here, um, if we kind of zoom into the spring flow recession, has one of the shallowest water depths um, among these different tributaries here, where it's deeper in Dutchville and even deeper in Mill Creek. And we see that 
the duration of out migration um, is significantly shorter. In fact, the stream really goes dry during this period in Porter Creek. And so these, these shallow water depths are certainly impacting that really critical duration of out migration for the juvenile coho. Um, indeed, it goes about three, four weeks longer in mill and industrial creeks. And now we can also look specifically at what depths these smolts are migrating at. And so in uh, Porter Creek and Dutch Bowl Creek, despite having different water depths at any given point in time, we see that it's really interesting. We get um, similar median, uh, median water depths for out migration, around seven centimeters in uh, both Dutch Bowl and Porter Creeks. Again, despite different times at which those water depths were experienced. So these are just histograms showing the number of protections um, and the RCT depth there on the uh, x-axis. And that's giving us an indication that maybe they actually are queuing into something about these water depths that does drive timing of their out migration. Of course, Mill Creek is strikingly different in this case, but as I mentioned earlier, it has a very different geomorphology. It has the step pool sequence, so we expect a lot of those shallow water depths at the RCTs to really be deeper. And now, instead of looking at one single year, let's look at one creek among a number of years and see how these detections um, in time here in green are kind of playing out. And if we think first again about um, how these water depths may be affecting the duration of out-migration, uh, we're beginning to see a bit of a signal um, within a single stream among different uh, water years as well. Some of the shallowest um, depths are experienced here in 2014, uh, 16, and uh, 18, 13. And you can see that some of those times, some of those years when the water depths do become shallow, those durations are, uh, are becoming a bit shorter. There is so much to see in, um, in these graphics here. Um, to focus in on something else as well, um, we shouldn't forget, of course, that there is a lot of migration happening during these peak flow events. It's really fascinating to see here in 2016 how um, one of the first events during 2016 really uh, facilitates a lot of that out migration you can see here. But as those uh, storm events continue, it looks like a lot of those out migrating juveniles have already left the system, or perhaps they weren't even allow. Um, they were able to resist uh, some of the uh, some of the flow as they became larger in size. So there could be a size issue um, of the juveniles um, that's unfolding there as well. And again, if we look at some of these median um, median deaths for migration, um, we see that some of those um, shallow years um, are associated with some of the, um, the shallower uh, medium water depths, uh, focusing in around um, seven to uh, nine centimeters in depth for the migration timing. And so let's, let's try to put some of these results a bit more into a management perspective. These are the same data from those histograms, but now we're seeing these um, on the y-axis with a cumulative proportion of out migration. Um, at or under which um, the certain uh, RCT depths are experienced. So if we have a goal of achieving 90% out migration, we might um, look at these graphs and say, okay, well, 90% of cumulative out migration is gonna require the water depths to reach, in this case, reported reef, at least 32 centimeters. For Dutch bill, it's gonna be a little bit different at about 22 centimeters. But of course, those water depths um, and the associated flows, those relationships vary significantly among these streams. So we developed the rating curves uh, for each of our five study streams, uh, where the rating curve is based on that median RCT depth again. And so you can see that these, where each color represents a different stream, uh, they're significantly, uh, statistically quite significantly different from one another, where each point here represents a different time at which both the discharge and RCT measurements were taken. And if we zoom into some of these shallow water depths that may be more important from a management perspective, um, we can start to see exactly how different those discharges to reach that same out migration facilitating water depth might be. If we have a target depth of nine centimeters, for example, for Mill Creek, that would require uh, only about 0.6 CFS of flow. 
but more than six times greater um, in the case of Dutchville Creek, which does have this very different geomorphology. And we wanted to explore a little bit about um, how the geomorphology may impact these rating curves uh, in this system. Because, you know, honestly, these rating curves, um, to get to this kind of precision, took a number of measurements and a number of hours um, of dedicated work in the field. And so it'd be nice to have something that a measurement could be taken even at one point in time and give us a better understanding of, of where we lie on the ranges of rating curves here. And so the plot on the left here shows the uh, intermediate diameter um, uh, D84 on the y-axis, um, so the substrate grain size, and the exponent here on the x-axis, the exponent of these rating curves here. And we chose the exponent to focus on in this case because generally you're going to have um, greater exponents when you have higher depth to discharge relationships. And so we measured a number of different um, geomorphic metrics in the field, but this D84 um, came out as one of the strongest in uh, having a relationship with those exponents. And uh, as we would expect, we have a positive relationship between that D84 and the exponent. We, of course, expect more roughness to increase the water depth um, in the system. And so perhaps the D84 could be a measurement that uh, managers use to get a better sense of where they lie on these rating curves. And I'd just like to leave you with a couple uh, takeaways from this work. Uh, number one, shallow water depths at these RCTs really do limit the duration um, of out migration. And we certainly saw that in that comparison between Porter Creek and the other creeks where uh, just the um, reduction in RCT depth certainly truncated the out migration duration. But among the tributaries within these watersheds, flow magnitudes uh, needed to reach desired water depths can vary significantly by at least a factor of six. And that was only in our five uh, steady streams here. But uh, as I move forward in my PhD, I'll be looking into um, further research to explore how uh, other variables may control the uh, water, um, uh, in addition to water depth, may control the out-migration timing. Some variables um, like water temperature, and I'll be looking more closely at the flow as well. So with that, I'd like to uh, thank a lot of uh, terrific individuals who dedicated a lot of time to um, working in the field and providing insights for this research, um, and my funders as well. So with that, I'd love to take any questions you all have. All right, nice presentation. Interesting work. Um, I wonder if, um, especially in site, in, in, uh, with regard to the smaller size in the earlier part of the season, if those earlier out migrations associated with high discharge might be passive, and those that are occurring later are behavioral. Yeah, that's something I've been thinking about um, recently a lot, to what degree that's volitional movement, and to what degree it's passive, and even exploring if any of those pit tags um, may actually be ghost tags, um, so not even uh, being held within a live fish. And, uh, and so on that ghost tag note, I, I did um, uh, extract any data that were from release years prior to the expected um, out migration timing. And when it comes to uh, more passive movement, um, I think that could certainly be the case. I think they are likely being you know, flushed out um, and growth uh, and size, I think, of the juveniles, uh, I would imagine plays a significant role in allowing them or disallowing them to resist um, that, uh, that movement downstream. Yeah, but I, I wish, I, I've been racking my brain to figure out ways in which I could uh, identify to what degree it is uh, more active movement versus volitional, and I'll probably be focusing a lot more of my work on the shallow water depths where we're more certain it's volitional. Thanks. Um, I just had a question about uh, kind of how uh, how much you can generalize the the relationships of, between RCT depth and like out migration duration or, or flow that you developed in these trips. Do you think that moving forward, if this were to become more of a management tool, that there would need to be specific um, curves developed for 
sort of each tributary that might be in a particular geomorphic class, or do you think that it might be possible to sort of have more standardized uh, relationships for given uh, geomorphic types that could be applied more broadly? Yeah, that's a great question. So I think number one, that there will be significant differences in uh, geomorphic classes in the flows required to reach certain depths, just as rating curves always tell us. Um, but I, I am starting to believe that there may be slightly more universal um, relationships between outmigration timing and water depth. Uh, these are really still all preliminary results, and I'm looking forward to conducting more statistical analyses to identify what strength the water depth does play in outmigration timing. But um, I think um, you know they certainly uh, can't uh, you know move over dry areas or you know incredibly incredibly shallow depths and below um, a centimeter or so. So, uh, so I think I think from that perspective, we can still set some thresholds that could be applied um, to management. But I am looking forward to seeing how those also relate to um, other covariates, um, salt oxygen, temperature, and many more. Yeah, all right, all right. Thank you all so much.